Welcome to the New Trust Economy, where your hosts, Blockchain 101 author and founder of Rise Housing, Monica Profit, and Inc. innovation columnist and brand casting strategist, Tracy Hazard, explore all things blockchain, ICO ventures, and cryptocurrency. Each week, they explore businesses, applications, and venture built on blockchain or cryptocurrency and address issues like women and diversity in tech, trust and distrust, and the economics of access and value. We would like to remind our listeners that investing in disruptive tech, ICOs, and cryptocurrency is speculative in nature and involves substantial risk of loss. We encourage you to invest carefully and do your due diligence first. Now, here's today's host, Monica Profit. Hi, and welcome to the New Trust Economy. I'm Monica Profit, and I'm here with Andy Strott, the founder and CEO of Resolute Fund. Welcome, Andy. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Monica. Glad to be here. Um, This is really exciting because we're in similar spaces and we've been overlapping for a long time. I feel like I've seen you around for years now. I mean, not, and that's kind of like in dog years in the blockchain space, right? It's like one year equals about seven. (laughs) Um, But yeah, so you're based in New York city, just like I am. And you've been, you've been tokenizing real estate, bringing blockchain to real estate for a while. I want to hear about what you've been, what strides you've been making, because it's exciting. I mean, not just that I'm a, a blockchain real estate nerd, but I think even to normal people who don't live and breathe this stuff. Um, what have been your most exciting kind of new projects lately? Well, so we are, you know, first and foremost, real estate investors. We've been involved in real estate for the past 10, 12 plus years. Uh, and I'll get into a little bit about our, our focus uh, in general. Uh, but it's really interesting, you know, now as we get into blockchain and, and technology, uh, getting coming into the real estate space, uh, I think really the most interesting thing is the people I've met, not only here in New York, uh, clearly a big tech hub here, but uh, everywhere. I mean, from China to the Middle East, uh, to Latin America, uh, it's just amazing how much this blockchain industry has taken off. And especially after the, the kind of change from the, the ICO phase about two, three years ago, it's, it's pretty amazing and, and actually very encouraging as well. So we're excited about the prospects. So a lot of people that know about uh, anything about tokens or blockchain, they really do know the, 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 the used to be the buzzword ICO. Can you describe, I, I could do this, but I feel like it would be better in your words. Um, could you describe how the ICO craze was its own unique animal and how this is really different from that? Because they still involve, you know, digital currencies, but you know, it's a pretty important distinction. How are you guys different than an ICO? No doubt, no doubt. So yeah, just to back up a little bit, just as you say, so it's still a very new industry. And I actually came into this and was kind of invited into it uh, just at the end of, of the ICO part of the uh, uh, part of the cycle here. So, you know, the, the ICOs were uh, in many ways uh, unregulated offerings, uh, I mean, not totally, but a lot of them were. Uh, they were more kind of catered and, and focused on utility tokens, um, different types of companies launching almost kind of like an IPO type craze back in the day. Yeah. Uh, but now, you know, there was obviously a correction in that part of the, the, the industry in the cycle. And for, for a good reason, U.S. regulators came in and, and across the world as well to really regulate the industry and these types of offerings. And now we refer to them as either, either a digital securities offering or a securities token offering. Obviously, the, the, the operative word there is securities, meaning they are securities offerings that need to be regulated. So that's what ours is. We're, we're a real estate fund. Uh, we're offering a digital share class of our fund, uh, and you'll see there are many more STOs, quote unquote, and DSOs in the marketplace, not just in real estate, but uh, all of them uh, done on a regular basis now, which is great for the industry. So if there, someone wanted to go shopping, shopping for STOs, where would they go to see some of these offerings? Uh, there are uh, tons of different types of just you know, websites and media types of companies that cover the blockchain industry. Uh, that do ratings on STOs. Clearly, we're seeing more and more, uh, many and more digital exchanges launching, not just here in the U.S., but in, in Singapore is a big hub for exchanges being launched uh, in, in other places as well. And it's really interesting because I think the, the majority of people who are involved in the blockchain space see it as kind of the overlying, overriding theme is to kind of recreate the, the financial system and the, the economy. I mean, we're a very small parts, a very small hub of this right now, but I think that there's you know, reason for creating more efficiency, uh, inviting more uh, different types of investors into the economy and to really take advantage of capitalism and to believe that blockchain is a way of doing that. So uh, that's why we're doing that with our real estate fund in particular. 
Okay, so this is pretty high level. You know, we were talking about bringing in efficiencies and bringing in transparencies, but can you take me through as an accredited investor? Right now, you're really only dealing with accredited investors, right? That's right. So, and institutional investors, which are just like the, the big money players. But um, as these things get played out and, and proven out, it seems like it's a very natural progression that we're going to see more and more things for retail investors. So it's, it's an early time, but it's actually where I think we're setting, we're teeing it up well for, for everybody to participate. So that's okay. kind of nice. Um, can you walk me through, you know, this fund offering, for example, or if you have like one specific asset offering, can you walk me through what that process is like and how it's any different from traditional um, investment? Sure. You know, traditional alternative investment funds, whether they're venture capital, private equity, or real estate funds, uh, are generally structured uh, more or less in a similar manner in that they have a, you know, a term life, generally seven years, 10 years or so. And it's done, obviously, strategically because a lot of the investments take, like to take that long to realize, uh, particularly in VC investments and what, uh, as well. So, you know, with blockchain and the idea behind of what Spice VC, one of the first tokenized funds out there, has done and others, is essentially to, to create a, a share class by using blockchain technology, a digital share class that represents a limited partnership share in the fund. And the concept and idea behind that is that you as a fund investor can, can invest in the fund and stay the full term life of the fund, just like any other PE investor. But with this digital share class, the ability to be actually, actually traded on an exchange, a digital exchange, gives you the opportunity to potentially buy and sell and trade your share class sooner than that seven or 10 year life term. So, you know, the thesis is that it provides a bit of liquidity into an otherwise illiquid asset class. Uh, that's probably one of the, the main ideas. I think there's many, many more benefits to just that itself, but just to kind of start from there, that's why, that's why we're doing this. So I'm gonna ask you questions that I know the answer to, but I also, I think that it, again, it's like, it's better coming from you. Um, so because we both are in the kind of, we see a lot of real estate things, we see a lot of blockchain things, we see a lot of technology investments, private equity is a part of our lives. But when you uh, talk about some of the, the liquidity and the opportunity to resell something, um, a lot of investors that I know are really concerned about their lockup periods, their lockups, meaning that like either for tax reasons or for the agreement purposes, they have to keep their money in something for that long. What is the typical lockup period and why for any one of these particular digital investments that you're looking at? Yeah, so per regulations, and thanks for asking that because a lot of people get confused about, you know, can I trade my shares day one or day two after I receive them, the, the digital shares that is from the blockchain offering, but that's not the case. You actually have to hold them for 12 months after the offering is, is finished before you can uh, quote unquote exchange them or trade your shares. So, and, you know, I think it's a good thing. R realistically, you know, if you're investing in a venture capital fund, real estate fund, or even private equity fund, I don't think there's that much need to, to sell within the first 12 months. Um, you know, I may be wrong, but I think that's really kind of a more uh, institutional type investors would take that same uh, kind of slant Approach. as we would on that. So that's, that's kind of my thoughts behind that. Yeah. So you have been raising a $250 million fund for a while. And you recently, I am so glad I'm on your mailing list because I got this little ping that was like, good uh, afternoon. Sure, sure. And here is the biggest news ever, which was um, <laughs> that you, you're kind of tied up with a new capital group, right? Can you talk about Moss? That's right. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's in this space in particular, there, there's a lot going on behind the scenes with, with a lot of different companies that you don't hear so much about. You hear a lot about Bitcoin all the time, some of the big names in this space, but there's so many other groups that are doing so many interesting things in blockchain for the past 12 to 24 months, again, since the beginning of 2018, really. And it's formed this, uh, I think, really strong infrastructure for the industry. So for us in particular, you know, we realized that it's a very new uh, structure for an asset class that's very old. So you have this traditional set of investors that are used to investing in real estate, private equity, real estate, but maybe not so with the blockchain structure and the way we have it set up. So we really need to kind of broaden our reach uh, really around the world through our partnership here with Moss Capital Group uh, that's based in Taiwan, who has uh, essentially built their own exchange called Moss X, uh, which is actually uh, in Taiwan as well. Uh, and through that network, uh, they are also owned by an entity in the Middle East called Gawa Holdings, uh, which you have a look at. They invest in and have invested in quite a number of blockchain type companies. Uh, we're the only and the first real estate company that they are partnering with us on. So with Moss and the resources through Gawa in the Middle East, 
we essentially are reaching a massive number of investors to bring into our offering here. And again, $250 million, to be honest, a lot of people may think we're crazy for putting such a big number in such a new uh, type of structure out there. Yeah. But yeah, I, you know, I've got to believe that we're at a part of the cycle now where not only is obviously the opportunity in the real estate market uh, prime for, for launching this, but I think the knowledge in the blockchain industry from institutional investors, family offices is right there as well. Yeah, absolutely. That's incredible. So really, if you have, I mean, raising a fund is raising a fund. People want to go out, they want to find their investors. Who's going to buy it is really of utmost importance. But being able to reach them is is kind of the, the missing piece in the blockchain space, right? Because you've either got people that are deep into t- to, uh, crypto and they understand digital, 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 but they're like, wait, real estate, how is that getting in here? It doesn't seem as volatile. It doesn't seem as exciting. Or there's real estate people that are like, ah, Oh my yeah. God, blockchain. I don't know. Is that just like Bitcoin? That means volatility. I don't want that, right? No doubt. That's exactly what we found. And you know, it's, it, it's, it, it's the process. I mean, raising it, like you said, raising any kind of private equity fund or raising money in general takes time. And, and generally, most of these funds that are out there, it's, it's a six, nine, 12 month process. And you know, ours is kind of working to be about the same. But it, it's just that it's, it's kind of uh, getting investors comfortable uh, and, and kind of teaching them more or less about how the blockchain, how blockchain works without getting too deep into things. Because, you know, to be honest, our structure is really not that, not that uh, detailed and not that. Uh, uh, something crazy. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. So, and, and that's why I think we're at a very good time right now to be able to go back out into the marketplace and raise some good money here for some investors who are interested in this space. Yeah, absolutely. And oddly, we're talking about people raising big amounts of money at a time when the economy has never been more unsettling and unsettled for so many people. It's, it's crazy it, for me as just a normal person walking around the streets of New York to then also be in like the private equity world, which seems completely oddly untouched by COVID and all of the craziness that's happened. Yeah, yeah, it's true. But, it, but you know, it's encouraging about blockchain in particular, too. I mean, you see a lot of names you probably wouldn't recognize that are new companies involved in, in developing new technologies within the space. But you also see, of course, JP Morgan. Uh, you see Goldman Sachs made some really key hires within the space with literally in the past two weeks because, because I think they're really starting to see that the digital uh, and blockchain space is, is something that they really believe in for the future. So that to me, as you know, as a small kind of boutique shop, is it's highly encouraging. And we've actually yeah. had some, some meetings with some bigger real estate uh, investment companies that are now kind of following us and tracking us as well and to see how, how we do here. That's fantastic. That is really cool. I mean, you guys have not just been doing real estate too. You've been talking with folks doing all kinds of things. I mean, tokenizing uh, different, what, what, like the UN was involved in some social impact initiatives. Is that what I remember? Yes. So, so Resolute.Fund, this is our core offering, which is a traditional real estate, real estate fund. We're focused on distressed mortgage debt in particular, uh, we have a lot of other things going on that we think are going to play out more into the future. We love to start tokenizing individual mortgage loans, mortgage bonds, pools of mortgages. But we also are working with another investor consortium of wealthy families here and really across the world in, in China and Asia as well to use blockchain technology f- for social purposes, for good, and really uh, still involved in real estate. For example, as, as you and I have discussed, one of the ideas is to... Uh, create coins or create digital currencies that reflect the value of land that indigenous people uh, habitate and and live on. Because we think that's a way for them to really be able to monetize the land that they've lived on for generations. And this is a, you know, I was a very, very forward thinking, uh, forward looking technology that they might not not be used to, but it's something in a service that we can provide for them to really be able to take advantage of capitalism, the economy and and, where they're based. We're also thinking about and working on creating derivative coins or derivative derivative tokens, which is to me is fascinating. And you know, we're not quite there yet as to actually implementing this, but the idea is is again, you know, if you have land, anything that's either under the land or on top of that land itself, you can create a d- derivative coin or derivative currency that reflects the value of whatever that is, whether it's minerals, water, clean energy, uh, whatever it may be. So. You know, down the road, the, the applications for blockchain in spaces like that and those types of opportunities to you know, not only provide a profit, but also help really kind of improve the world is uh, something we're phenomenally excited about. And there's some, there's some really interesting people, smart people, powerful people behind a lot of what we're involved with. So we're, we're thrilled to be part of it, to be honest. 
Yeah, the, the derivative coin thing was so interesting to me because the first thing I think of as a derivative coin is something more like, can you just pull the cash flow off of an apartment building and say the rents are its own thing and the underlying assets another? That's a little, it's odd because, you know, when you really think about it, a lot of, it, like Baltimore is a great example. You, know, you have all the, all the assets in the world and if you don't have a community that's really functioning in it, not to say all of Baltimore is dysfunctional, but like as a real estate market, there's, it's a very unique animal. It's almost like, the, you know, a, another version of a, what Detroit was in many people's eyes. It, and it's just, it's a place where there's the cash flows don't keep up with the assets, the underlying assets, and therefore they depress them and the assets therefore like lose value. But how, how is that even possible? It's the same bricks and mortar. I mean, when you look at this, it's just all such a soft science. But one person described to me the, the derivative assets as it um, relates to raw materials in the ground as saying, you know, a lot of times that material is worth more in the ground than out of the ground. In yeah. a, in a yeah. sense that, you know, it, why bother extracting it just to then physically separate it to then be able to trade it? Why not leave it where it is and call that its own value add, which is yeah. an interesting perspective, right? Not everybody looks at it that way. Uh, I'm sure plenty of people in the, in the energy sector wouldn't necessarily think that, but the people that are thinking in terms of conservancy, they very much think it's, it's worth more in the ground than out of the ground. No doubt, no doubt. And, and you think about that worldwide, again, whether it's here in the U.S. or whether it's in, in Africa, clearly there's, there's tons of opportunities there to, to do to do some good with with this type of technology and these types of ideas. I mean, all the way obviously to Asia as well. There's, uh, and again, and then the underlying technology behind it as well, the blockchain, it just keeps evolving and, and getting more and more uh, you know, kind of institutional quality and, and you know, just, just fascinating tech advancements that, that will allow us to do all of this. And, right. you know, I think it's just, it's a new, it's a new era, it's a new phenomenon that I think is slowly catching on and again, as you see more and more of the institu these institutional groups and these names like a JP Morgan or, or Goldman behind it, uh, even if it's a small percentage of their business, that's, that's such a huge positive for-, for Yeah, it's a huge positive, yeah. yeah. And for the future as well, yeah. So when you talk about this $250 million fund, I mean, that's a, that's a huge number to many, many people. Um, yes. Even 25 million is a huge number to many, many people, right? Even 2 million is a huge number. But um, when you take these giant numbers, these giant fund ideas and you break them down, you know, ultimately, what would this mean? I think that you said there was some sort of like small, it was almost in, in uh, crypto terms, it'd be like a soft cap. Like what's the amount that you need to raise to be able to start doing the work you want to do with this money? Yeah. So as I mentioned, we focus primarily on distressed mortgages and non-performing mortgage debt. Uh, clearly when a, a very challenging time, uh, you know, across the country, uh, economically uh, in, in many ways, and, and the real estate market is obviously starting to reflect that. Um, you know, whether it's New York City here where we're based or uh, California, wherever it may be, I guess the only place where it's really not, doesn't seem to be affecting it too much is in single family home resales, which seems to be, yeah. I mean, as you can see around here in the metro area and other parts of the country. That's not to say that we don't expect a lot of defaulted mortgages in the single family home space, which we in fact do. And we've seen numbers that are actually pretty staggering. You know, what we try and do uh, just to kind of give you an idea of the sense of our investment strategy, uh, we actually try and work with the borrowers first. When we take over these loans, for example, from banks, we try and work with the borrowers first to, to really get them on a, if we can, on a, on a regular payment plan. Yeah. And, you know, rather than going directly to foreclosure, taking somebody's home away from them or, or a property away from a small business, whatever it may be, we try and start with the borrower first. And if they're able and they're willing, if that works out, fantastic, because they can stay in their home, they can stay in their, in their real estate that they've owned and operated for many years. You know, it doesn't always work out. And if you have to foreclose, you have to foreclose, that's, that's where that is. But, you know, again, with the number you mentioned, number we've targeted, there's, you know, from a percentage of the total amount of distress we're gonna see out there, I think it's pretty small. I think you and I have talked about the numbers that the big name groups have raised for distress, it's over a trillion dollars. So oh my God. Um, it's yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting, challenging times, but um, hopefully not, not won't last too long. We'll see. Well, I mean, the, the blockchain angle here is a really interesting one in terms of bringing the, the level of uh, needed to, to be able to participate kind of down, right? I mean, once we see more, yeah. of, more of this activity happen and this isn't such a nascent space, we're going to see more opportunities for the average person to in, engage. And that'll be really helpful. I mean, hopefully soon people won't have to go all in with a huge amount of debt that they potentially could lose everything rather than just buying pieces and shares and, and building wealth over time. Um, it could just, it could be really be a game changer for the way people can can build up their their personal wealth and from the small guy to the top guy, right? That's right. That's right. But, yeah, well, it's, it's such you know, a big... with all the oh sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Lee, go ahead. Oh, but with all of the different things that you've been involved in, it it seems like you're quite the a generalist. I mean, how did you how did you first get hooked into this world? What brought you to it? 
<laughs> that's exactly what happened. I got hooked into it. So I was, you know, as I said, traditional real estate investor uh, in finance, you know, pretty much my entire career. Uh, advise a couple of startups here and there over the past 10 years. But no, actually, uh, one of the biggest landlords here in New York City in Brooklyn uh, was actually working on a project of tokenizing a building here on the Upper East Side. Uh, this is about two, three years ago. And uh, I was actually asked to and invited to come into the partnership to, to run it, uh, you know, kind of take over as CEO and really see the whole offering to fruition. So as that happened, it was really towards the end of that you know, kind of end of 2017, early 2018, and things really just kind of came to a halt as far as the ICOs and any kind of yeah. offerings were, were happening. So uh, we just held off ourselves. We said, let's wait, see what happens with the regu regulatory bodies. And in the meantime, let's kind of broaden this from just a building to a fund where we'll have more opportunities to put more capital to work and really in the same type structure. That's fantastic. So you just sort of learned about it because you'd already been raising money for buildings for a long time. Yeah, that's right. And and it was getting and in, coming into the digital space, the blockchain space. Again, there's some uh, obviously some incredibly smart people in this space. It is also, if you I mean, you know probably better than I do. It's and it has been a very collaborative space as well. Like I think yeah. any new technology where people are all trying to build up the industry and make it work. Uh, you know, people, other real estate funds, groups, and others. You know, I've talked to so many others on a regular basis because we all just want to try and make blockchain a big success. So that's yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, speaking of other players and stuff, I mean, what are some of the biggest challenges that you're seeing that you need solved? If somebody was out there listening, who who do you wish was hearing you right now uh, that could help make that would that would fill in the perfect piece to like really help this this type of initiative along? Sure. I mean, I think for from an investor perspective and, and really raising capital for an offering like this, it's making sure those end investors are comfortable enough with what we're doing. So, you know, Moss, Moss Capital, as well as our partners in the Middle East, uh, you know, they're, they're blockchain experts. Uh, Swarm, who as our technology provider, our blockchain technology provider, whom you know very well in the industry as well, uh, are phenomenal, excellent. And they've been great, again, themselves at kind of promoting the industry and, and making people aware and and, and more understanding of how the actual technology works so that it doesn't so it's not overbearing and that people right. can you know normal investors can really kind of come in and see that it's something they can participate in without really being too worried about the the technology side of it yeah absolutely i mean swarm those technology partners are so key especially on the back end of these blockchain offerings that so you have to have that all done and and that's been that's been like the first building block towards and then the second one is you know folks that know how to bring assets such as real estate and the next part is folks that know how to bring investors and it's just we're building this thing bit by bit it's taking i mean you, you can't build something this big out of nothing very quickly but it's still it feels like it's taking forever right i well, that's right. And, and, you know, to really bring the institutional groups on board, I mean, you need, you need obviously them to be comfortable with, with custodianship, uh, with the legal side of things, the technology side of things. So, you know, we work with, work with a company called Copper uh, for custodianship. It's a military grade technology. Uh, so, you know, things like that from an institutional perspective, even family office perspective, they've got to be comfortable with all of that, that they're traditionally come up, comfortable with uh, in the non-blockchain uh, types of investments. So, yeah, we're, we're, we're getting there and it's moving. At it's lightning. getting there slowly but surely. <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. Yeah, well, um, this has been, I mean, it's, it's wonderful to hear about what the strides that Resolute Fund is doing. And outside of Resolute Fund, have you, is, every, is everything falling under the Resolute sort of umbrella or do you have other things that are kind of outside that you're straying further from your core, core mission? Yeah, no, this is, this is kind of our main focus right now. We, you know, as I said, we're traditionally traditional real estate investors. So we have just our, our regular real estate investments on the side. Apart from blockchain, we have different types of structures we use, more traditional for investing in distressed mortgage debt uh, and other types of, of opportunities. So, so if someone was a little bit freaked out by, by all this Bitcoin blockchain stuff, but they still really liked what you were talking about, they could, they could do it. They don't have to just sign on to digital assets right away. No, not at all. Not at all. This is just one of our offerings. You know, we are more uh, than began as a traditional investment boutique, uh, traditional shop, just like everybody else in the space. Um, we're one of the leaders here now and probably one of the few that are offering this new technology for investors. So yeah, it's all there and available for anyone. That's fantastic. That's great. And so we're going to make sure that there are links for where people can find you um, and not only like in LinkedIn and whatnot, but also Resolute Fund and everything that you're up to. Um, and if they are an accredited investor or institutional, or they just want to learn more, 
We've got uh, all the links ready for people to, to click on and see that. We're also going to have you pushed out through our Twitter feeds and all of that. So are you, are you on Twitter? Is there like a Twitter <laughs> feed for distressed Resolute. mortgages? <laughs> uh, that I don't know, probably. Uh, so we have, you know, Resolute has their own Twitter handle. You can go and see uh, some of our postings there. I have my own as well as the CEO, uh, mostly related to our work with Resolute and distressed mortgages. But it's all related to everything we've talked about here today. So Absolutely. Yeah, so people can find that. you. That's great. That's great. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you taking the time to explain what you've been up to. And I feel like we're probably going to have a follow up here in six months. And you're going to be like, we're going to, we're taking over. We have 250 million. It's all going to happen. <laughs> Let's hope so. Let's hope so. Thanks, Monica. I really appreciate being on today. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Andy. I'll talk to you soon, I'm sure. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. You've been listening to The New Trust Economy. We'd love to hear your comments on today's show, as well as suggestions for future topics and guests. Visit us online at newtrusteconomy.com or on social at newtrusteconomy. Thanks for exploring The New Trust Economy with us.